Hey dudes, it's Marty from Needlebutt Farms, and today we're talking about honey. Hey dudes, welcome to my office. So I think the best place to start with what is honey actually is I just went to the FDA's website and I pulled the definition. The definition is a thick and sweet, like myself, syrupy substance that bees make as a food from nectar of plants or secretions from living parts of the plant and store in a honeycomb. So you notice that pollen was nowhere in that definition. It was all about the nectar. So what is nectar? Nectar is a really sweet substance that plants uh, produce and it's to serve a couple different purposes. So the first one is pollination. So you'll have things like bees or butterflies or sometimes hummingbirds or bats will come in, they'll drink the nectar, but in the process they'll pick up some of the pollen and they'll help that plant to reproduce by moving the pollen around to other plants. Uh, they can also produce nectar for defense, so some types of ants and some types of wasps will come in and they'll drink nectar out of plants and they'll actually protect those plants from other insects that just come in to eat the leaves like beetles. And then they also will produce nectar for food. So in the case of things like carnivorous plants, they'll actually trick insects to come in and then they'll just eat the insect. So nectar is really important and we're going to continue to talk about nectar a little bit more. So with all this talk about nectar, what is pollen? Well, glad you asked. It's tree sperm, baby. So pollen, being tree sperm, is very small. It will end up getting in your honey regardless, even though the bees don't intentionally put it in there. It's just super small. So it's going to end up in there. So pollen is normally on the stamen of the plant. The bees will come in, get the nectar from under that, pick up some of the pollen. Sometimes they'll get the pollen on purpose, but normally it's all over them. And then they'll fly to another plant. They'll accidentally get that sticky pollen all over everything. Hopefully that plant will be able to get fertilized through its ovule. And then the ovule that is fertilized will start to produce a fruit. Sometimes it's an apple. Sometimes it's a fruit that you don't even acknowledge as a fruit, like a dandelion. And then that plant is able to reproduce through that process, which is why the plant produces nectar and it's important to have bees in the ecosystem. That's why people always say, if the bees die, we die, because now most of the fruit is not going to get pollinated. So that brings us to the next part of this. How do bees get all of the pollen and nectar back to the hive? So right here, they've got their legs. On those legs, there's really long hairs, and that's called the pollen basket. So what happens is they'll rub up on all this pollen, all the pollen will start sticking together. They'll get little granules of pollen all developed on there. Once they go back to the hive, another bee will take that pollen and put it wherever pollen goes in the hive. And then they have this thing here. It's called a proboscis. It's basically a super long straw. So they use their proboscis to get down in there and suck up all the nectar. So they will take that nectar and they will put it right here in what's called a crop or a honey stomach. So bees have two stomachs, cows have four stomachs, I have one stomach, nature is weird, we're gonna talk about the bees. So the bees have the two stomachs, the crop right here, and then their normal stomach is right past that. So some of that nectar, they will just like go right past it, get digested, give it fuel, give it the energy to go do bee stuff for the rest of its happy life. But most of it will sit right here in the honey crop, and I think it maxes out at 40 milligrams of nectar, that they will take back to the hive. Once they get back to the hive, they offload the pollen and then they offload the nectar. So they will give it to a worker bee who's just working full time in that hive. And what that worker bee will do is he will take the nectar, which is technically bee throw up, but it doesn't have acid and stuff. So it's not quite as gross as my throw up, but it's still kind of weird. But so they'll take that nectar, they'll pass it off to the first worker bee. The first worker bee will take that, they'll put it in their crop, bring it back up. It has some special enzymes in it that will help it to um, separate the water and the sugars. And then they'll just blow bubbles with it. So they'll start blowing bubbles in the nectar. And what this does is it'll take a drop of nectar, give it the most surface area that it can get. And then the natural airflow in the hive will help the water content to lower. So nectar starts off at 70 to 80% water content. And what we want it to be, well, we and the bees, what the bees are working for is they want it to be about 15 to 18% water content. And that's how they get the honey. 
So your first worker bee will take it, chew on it for a little while, try and aerate it, blow bubbles on it, try and get the airflow on it, and lower the water content. Once it gets a little lower, they'll pass it off to the next bee who does the same thing. And normally they'll have an assembly line of like 10 bees who will go through this process until it gets to the end and the water content is low enough. Once the water content is low enough, they will put it in a honeycomb and then they will cover it in wax. And once the water content is low enough, it actually will make it where the honey cannot rot. And that's partially because there's not enough water there for anaerobic or fermentation, uh, anaerobic respiration or fermentation to take place, which is what bacteria use when they're eating stuff. But also they have pretty effectively cleaned it with that enzyme. And then they put it in here, they cover it up and it's just meticulously kept super clean. And now it's, when it's capped, it can no longer get contaminated by things. And so archeologists and stuff have found this honey in things like Pharaoh's tombs and stuff, and it's still edible. I don't know if I would eat it. Eh, yeah, I would. Who, are, who am I trying to kid? I would absolutely eat it just to say I ate Pharaoh honey. But um, yeah, they say that that honey is still good after thousands of years of being buried, and that's because the bees went through the process of lowering the water content, getting the enzymes in it, and capping it and sealing it and preserving it. So outside of what the bees are doing, you might also wonder why are there different flavors, colors, and textures to honey? And if you open your bee Bible with me to page 271, you can go through a bunch of the different types and you can go through there, see their flavor profile, see what color they'll normally end up, see what time of year they get harvested. But um, that's pretty scientific and we're not gonna get into that. So the easier way to look at this is in spring, you're generally going to get lighter honey and in fall, you're going to get darker honey. So lighter honey is normally a little more fruity. Uh, it, it's more like a simple syrup and I prefer lighter honey. And then later in the year during a fall harvest, you'll get darker honey. And sometimes in spring you'll get dark, sometimes in fall you'll get light, but generally that's the rule. And so the darker honey that you get in fall is what more people are familiar with because it's more common. And so it's going to be like a little bit thicker, a little bit darker, a little bit richer. And it's like when you taste honey, you're like, ooh, that's honey. So that's where you get the color differentiations from. But also temperature has a part to play. So you can get liquid honey. So this is liquid honey. It's my secret stash of liquid honey. It's a late spring. Uh, it tasted kind of like cherries and peppers, if I remember correctly. And so you have liquid honey. That's what everyone's familiar with. But when your honey sits for too long, so this is a friend of mine from Ohio, it can crystallize. So if you look at that up close, now let's back it up a little bit. This is basically a solid right now. So it crystallized up. That's okay. It's still fine. Some people like it crystallized. You can take it out and it's a solid. So that's pretty fun. Um, but also I had another batch of his and if yours crystallizes, you can make it uncrystallized pretty quickly by just putting it in warm water. I actually just did this to make this not crystallized. So you can get crystallized honey, you can get liquid honey. That's the same batch, just one of them. I heat it up. So when you heat it up, you just put it in warm water. It'll help the crystals to break down and just put it back in its normal liquid state. Uh, if you put it in too high of heat, like if you put it in a boiler or something, it can actually discolor your honey and actually cook it a little bit which will change the flavor. Maybe you like it to be cooked a little bit. I don't, so that's how you do that. Um, when this crystallizes, you can actually do something really interesting. So I have some more crystallized honey. You can tell it's crystallized because it ain't going anywhere. It's, it's very solid. So you can actually take this, you can whip it, and you can make a thing called whipped honey. So this is whipped honey. I use it for some sweet and savory tacos. Uh, it's kind of like a marshmallow cream. It's pretty good. Uh, you mix spices in it. It's a pretty popular thing that people do. And this is where you get whipped honey from. So you take crystals, you put it in a blender or a food processor, you whip it up really good. You'll mix in more um, honey into it, but you have to have the crystals because what happens, there's a chemical reaction I'll be honest, I don't totally understand, 
but basically the glucose and nectar has a semi-chemical reaction at temperatures between 40 and 60-ish degrees where it just starts to take that glucose and make it into like actual sugar crystals. And then it can continue to move itself out. Once you put that in a food processor, it kind of connects the dots between all the food crystals, makes it um, more. And so some people, when they make this cream honey, it's like really gritty and that's not very good. So you'll wanna mix some normal honey into it and it'll kind of smooth it out a little bit. And that's what I've done to make my creamed honey here. Um, and that's just what people do to use their honey for different reasons. So the, the interesting thing about cream honey is it's actually in this state between a liquid and a solid, kind of like butter. You're like, what is this? I'm sure theologians and, and philosophers have argued about this for years. I'm, I wasn't there, but I'm just assuming that's something that happened. But yeah, this is where you get your, your flavors and your textures and your colors of honey from. So I know what you're thinking. If bees can make honey, what else can make honey out there? Can I get some butterfly honey? No, you can't, it doesn't exist. Can I get some carpenter bee honey? Again, no, you can't, it doesn't exist. Bumblebee honey, you could get it, but you would have to kill a lot of bumblebees for it. And from what I've heard, it's not very good. So bumblebees are one of the few other insects that actually make honey but it's a very small amount. It's like this much. It's not a whole beehive's worth. And what that is for is the queen will come in, lay her eggs, forage, get a lot of nectar. She will lay her eggs, all the bumblebees are born. Then in their last set of babies that are made, they're all queens and um, they eat all the honey. They try and make it through winter. They come back and then they do it all over again. So there's not actually enough honey to uh, make it through the winter because that's not how bumblebees are designed to live. So you actually can't get honey from really anything else because bees are just unique in that area. So even though other things might be called bees, it's because of certain like genetic similarities. It's not because they all go out and produce honey and harvest nectar and do all of that stuff. So bumblebees do make honey. You can't harvest it. And honeybees do make honey, which is why they're called honeybees. So last but not least, I'm going to talk about the effects of honey with diabetes and allergies. So I am not a doctor, but I have researched these things and I have learned a lot over the last six or seven years working with bees. And also I do have a biology degree, so I have learned a pretty significant amount, but I am not a doctor. So I'm just gonna give you some of the wave tops. So first with diabetes, the glycemic index of a tablespoon of sugar is going to be 60. The glycemic index of a tablespoon of honey is going to be 58. It is better, but it's not significantly better. So you need to stay away from all added sugars if you're diabetic and you can add a little bit of honey, but you still have to count it because it is basically sugar. So what's great about honey that sugar doesn't have. Sugar is just raw sugar. Honey also has some antioxidants in it. It has little amounts of protein, zinc, um, and fiber in it. So it is a little bit better for you, but just be careful when you're consuming honey because it is still considered an added sugar. Also, when you look at allergies, allergies what honey affects with allergies is a thing um, in immunotherapy. So it's where if your body is reacting to a certain thing, you take a little bit of that thing and a little bit of that thing to help build up your body's tolerance to it. So with things like pollen in allergy season, honey might help it, but there are some important things to think about. So Buying local honey is important because for me, if I suffer from spring allergies and I'm taking a bunch of honey from a place that's producing it in Vietnam, that's not going to help me a lot because that's going to be boosting my immune system to things that are in Vietnam. And I'm not in Vietnam. I'm way over here in North Carolina. So that's why buying local honey is important for you. So the local honey, if you can get it from somewhere that's actually in the city, it's going to have pollen and nectar and things that you are actually 
um, exposed to that you can build up a tolerance to. It's not going to immediately cure it, but it can build up an immune system to things in your local area. But when you're thinking about this, just know that some plants are different from others. So some plants that produce nectar are going to be the ones that also produce pollen that might be messing with your allergies, but there are certain types of plants like pine trees that don't produce nectar. So the bees are not collecting pollen from pine trees. And pine trees spread their gametes out by wind dispersion. So when me, especially in North Carolina, everything is yellow, that's from the pine trees. And no amount of honey, well, maybe a little bit of honey would help, but really my body's just going to have to deal with that. So sometimes the honey is really good for your allergies, but sometimes it's just a selling point that people use. So don't be a sheep. All right, dudes. Well, hopefully you guys learned a bunch about honey. If you have any questions, just leave them in the comments. Make sure to like and subscribe because that's how YouTube can pay me money and all of that money will go back into the bees so I can make more content from you guys if you like and subscribe with these videos. Thanks. Have a good rest of the week.